Farm, actually the first approval for the first agent, uh, first Bisco supplement agent in the United States came 19 years ago. Um, it's been used for much longer than that, of course, and it's used in a variety of hyaluronic, hyaluronic acid, which is the basis of visco supplementation, has been used in different forms for you know well over a couple decades in multiple different medical fields, ranging from uh, cosmetics all the way to neurosurgery. The specific topic that was developed for this um, conference was the use in joints, particularly osteoarthritic joints, for the management of the disability and the pain that comes along with osteoarthritis. It is approved in the United States for specifically knee osteoarthritis, but I actually expanded to the use of non-FDA approved joints uh, that have been widely used, hips, shoulders particularly, but also used in sacroiliac joints, facet joints, uh, metacarpophalangeal joints and others. All of the products that are available in the United States are approved by the FDA for osteoarthritis of the knee. They usually come in the sequence of treatment after you have already exhausted some of the conservative management, typically basic analgesics as well as physical therapy. Uh, they, there are actually eight products that are marketed and that are approved by the FDA. Six different products and two that are the same parent compound, but they're in a one injection regimen as opposed to being multiple injection regimens like most of the others. Uh, some of these are uh, basically going back to what I said, given as a one injection treatment, and the others are given as multiple injections given one week apart, ranging from anywhere from one, of course, all the way to five weekly injections. There are certainly some potential adverse events, but they're very low in terms of their incidence. The one that is most widely uh, raised as concern is the incidence for, or the appearance of a pseudo-septic arthritis or pseudo-septic joint, which is an inflammatory reaction that occurs when it's injected in the joints, but it's not really a, an infection or a septic joint, it's rather a, an inflammation, an inflammatory response of the body to something foreign that is injected and is usually self-limited within probably two to three days. The, I mean, of course, others, it could be an infection, it could be increased joint pain and anything that is related to a procedure when it's not performed properly where you could actually injure other uh, structures. The evidence is actually quite controversial. Um, there have been a number of um, different societies that have called into question its efficacy. Uh, most uh, notably, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery, they had a position statement back in, I believe it was in 2013, I believe, uh, where they, they pull data on multiple studies showing or, or stating that it wasn't efficacious in delaying any sort of uh, joint replacement surgery in the knee. However, there have been multiple other publications, particularly or more specifically a Cochrane database review that was published a couple years ago that shows their efficacy. Um, again, one of the biggest concerns here or the biggest challenges is choosing the patient appropriately. And the fact that there are many different, possibly different phenotypes of osteoarthritis that may have better or not so great responses to this therapy specifically. That is the main purpose of this conference, which is uh, provide them with another option for patients that have osteoarthritis and pain and disability related to it, where they could have potentially a medication sparing effect, particularly an opioid sparing effect in some 
patients that could actually be helpful for keeping them functional and preventing or avoiding having to use medications that are quite problematic at times in terms of their systemic side effects.